From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Rhode Islander Ken Block has made a name for himself as an expert in data collection and analysis, especially when it comes to elections. In 2020, that expertise was called on by the Trump campaign seeking hard numbers to show the election had been stolen. In the end, Block didn't find what Trump wanted. But in his new book, Disproven, Block warns significant changes should be made to voting systems nationwide. Our guest this week on Newsmakers, Ken Block. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Later in the show, we're going to be talking about a major announcement in the westbound Washington Bridge. But first, our guest, Ken Block, author of Disproven. Ken, congratulations on the book. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So I don't feel like uh, this is going to be any spoiler alert because the title of your book is literally called Disproven. <laughs> uh, but let's cut to it. That, as I said in the top of the show, the Trump campaign called you, paid your company, $750,000 to look for data that supported voter fraud. You did not find widespread fraud. We did not. We found small instances, small numbers of deceased voters in most of the swing states, by small, less than a dozen. We found a couple of hundred duplicate votes cast by voters who cast a vote in one of the swing states and also some other state. Uh, really small, not enough to swing the course of any election in 2020, but then much more importantly, the campaign started sending me claims of fraud made by other people. And those claims ran the gamut from... What was the wildest claim? The, by far, my favorite story to tell. Wisconsin, I received a claim brought forward by a group of volunteers, their, their own dis description of themselves. I had to go, I was directed to go to the Donald.Win website where the particulars of this claim were, and they claimed to have found more than 700,000 duplicate votes cast in the state of Wisconsin. That's a lot. They made a basic mistake. They didn't have the in-person votes with the data they looked at, which left them short 700,000, and that's where they sort of went, well, the votes aren't here. There must be duplicate votes. They got very excited. They took their finding to the manager of a, of a golfer. First of all, they took a, to a golfer. The golfer took the claim to the manager of a Trump golf course. The manager of the Trump golf course sent wow. the claim to Eric Trump, who then sent the, the claim to the lawyer that I reported to, Alex Cannon, on the campaign, who sent it to me. And it took me about a half an hour to show them why it was wrong, and we put it to bed. One of the, you mentioned Alex Cannon, one of the, the lawyer who hired you and you, you worked with. And it's interesting, you say one of the early chapters uh, about how you saw kind of the two Trump worlds in front of you. Oh, and this yeah. was a theme all through his administration, and you saw it in that campaign. You had kind of the, I, I guess I would say, kind of normal, old-fashioned Republican lawyers who wanted to protect their professional reputations but wanted to be aggressive advocates for the president. Correct. And then the kind of out there lawyers we saw in that fall after the election. Sidney you know, Powell. Sidney Powell, what Rudy Giuliani did. Um, I guess, what did you make of that dynamic that you saw, getting to see that up close like most of us did not? Yeah, uh, while it was going on, I didn't, I, first of all, I was extremely busy. We had 35 sure. days to audit a national election. There wasn't much time for chit chat. Uh, I do know a couple of times as I, in my communications with Alex, and by the way, I have to throw some roses at Alex for allowing me to do a straight up analysis. He didn't ask me to custom deliver a finding of fraud. And he was and high up in the Trump He was very high up in the Trump campaign yeah. apparatus. And most importantly, he gave me political cover. Mm. My mm -hmm. involvement, my personal involvement, my company's involvement, the names weren't known to the Oval Office, which kept away the political pressure of why aren't you delivering what we need type type thing. So, yeah, I once or twice while I, during the 35 days, Alex did hint to me that there was a lot of bad stuff happening between his group of lawyers and the other lawyers, and I knew who they were at the time, obviously. But then the January 6th depositions in vivid color bring out just how badly those two sides were at war with each other. You know, uh, Ken, y you say that you got the political cover, your name and your company's name, Simpatico Software, was not known to the Oval Office, but it is now. Yes, and, it is. And you're, you were part of a, a congressional report, I think, uh, initially, or it was hinted at, and that, that was you, and then you've written a book about it. Yeah. Have you gotten any blowback or even threats for... Uh, so. You know, I'm not going to talk about personal security issues because that just invites problems if you talk about it. Sure. Uh, I'll tell you that there really hasn't, other than the basic social media, what do you mean you're a liar type stuff? No. 
And uh, that's good because, I mean, look, it's a very factually written book. I want it to be even-toned in terms of my description of the fraud claims I received. It's really important to me that everybody, including conservatives, have the ability to understand why the election wasn't stolen, the nature of the claims that were processed, the, the mistakes that were made in a lot of those claims that came my way. And I can't have that conversation if I'm writing confrontationally and if I'm passing judgment. So I don't do that. Well, and, you know, and I, I have to say one of the things that impressed me on the book was actually the back cover. You have former Attorney General William Barr, who, of course, broke with Trump at the end and has been very critical of Trump since over these false election claims. Brad Raffensperger, the Georgia Secretary of State, who many called him a hero because he did not uh, give in to Trump's pressure to find the 11,000 votes in Georgia. They both praised your work. I, I think as a reporter reading it, it frankly it reminded me of sometimes what we go through when there's sort of a hot kind of I don't know if I should say rumor or like a point of view people have that we think we've seen the facts that disprove, disprove it, and yet it's hard to get them to agree with that. I mean, how, how do you reach people who just believe in their bones the election was stolen and maybe aren't looking for facts on that? They just believe it. Well, you know, the first challenge for me is to be able to know that my information is getting to them. And that's been a real challenge with this book, because even though it's neutrally written and it's just the facts, uh, m the coverage of my whole story, being subpoenaed by Jack Smith, being subpoenaed by Fonnie Willis, uh, and this book and everything else, I'm not getting any coverage in conservative Have media. you been on Fox News? I only got on Fox 5 in D.C. I haven't been on but any not, other. But other not the but, network but, but not Fox the network. News. No, it's been really, I couldn't even get an opinion piece published in the Wall Street Journal. Oh, really? Because yeah. they, they like to say they're at least open to Trump critics on this kind yeah. of thing. It's been really frustrating. So we spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about how the thrust, the first half of your book, which a lot of it is you're teaching people how you look at the data and walk them through it yeah. and didn't find widespread voter fraud. But you do write about sort of the second half. You think there needs to be reforms in the election system we're limited on time here. I so what's your big ticket item? It's, well, th there, are, there, are, uh, there are a number of big ticket items, but if I was going to pick one that would fundamentally change how we conduct our elections, that change would be moving to a federal voter registration system. One of the big problems we have with our elections is people move from state to state, and states don't cooperate with each other. The information doesn't get cleaned up, and it leaves you open with multiple duplicate registrations all over the place. I believe we should even do away with registration. You should be qualified to vote. You are qualified to vote by the Constitution when you're born or naturalized. So we should issue voter registration IDs at birth, at naturalization, and you carry that one identifier with you through your life and vote. Wait, real quick, because I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I was genuinely curious about that. Um, you know, the Constitution empowers states. Uh, to handle voting, would it need a constitutional amendment no, to do what you want to because do? Because the Congress is empowered to pass laws as they see fit to provide guidance for how our elections are conducted. The difference in how states execute bail, mail ballots between state to state and county to county is a mess. I mean, there, there, there are so many things that are wrong, and we should really consider outlawing uh, ballot harvesting across the country because when you have some states that deliver harvested ballots that count towards congressional races and other states that don't, that's fundamentally a really big difference in how, in how elections are conducted. And we, the voter experience for our federal elections should be the same everywhere, and it's not. Ken, how, so the end of the 2020 election was a pretty pretty tough time for American democracy. You had the sitting president trying to overturn, you know, using you because he wanted to overturn the results. We end with violence at the Capitol on January 6th. We're now heading into another national election. The same people on the ballot, including the man you worked for here. How worried are you? I'm worried. I don't see that the conversation is changing in terms of the claims of voter fraud and that voter fraud, what the impact of voter fraud was in 2020. And just in 30 seconds or less, what I want to be able to say to everybody is that for sure, the reason that Trump lost, and it shows up in my data, Trump's own pollster told him the same thing immediately after the election. Brad Raffensperger determined this in data in Georgia, is that Trump lost the rhinos. He didn't want them. He told them to get lost. They did. And in the swing states, you can show that his loss was almost exclusively because he told the uh, rhinos to get lost. Ken, we have to go to a break here. but. Uh 30 seconds, as you say, or less. Uh, you got a couple of book events coming up. Yes, please. So I'm going to be at Barrington Books on Saturday, March the 23rd at 4 o'clock. 
selling books and signing books. If you've already bought a book, you can bring it there, I'll sign it. There are tickets online. And on Tuesday, the 26th, at 5 o'clock, uh, former Mayor Joe Paolino is moderating a uh, conversation about the book at the Guild in Pawtucket, 5 o'clock on Tuesday, the 26th. Beer and books. Yeah. I like that idea. All right, <laughs> yeah. Ken Block, author of Disproven. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, when we come back, we're talking about the Westbound Washington Bridge, how it needs to be rebuilt, a reporter's roundtable on Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. This is a Reporters Roundtable. Joining me and Ted Nisi, Nancy Lavin from Rhode Island Current, and Eli Sherman, Target 12 investigator. I want to, if we can, uh, play a soundbite from Governor Dan McKee uh, from a press conference on Thursday when he announced they are going to rebuild the westbound Washington Bridge. Today we are announcing that we will be replacing the bridge. but also accountability and the day of reckoning for those who are responsible for the position that we're in and the position that the people in the state of Rhode Island in, uh, that day is coming and is coming very soon. I'm not happy about the fact that where we are right now, I don't know if you got that impression. All right, that was Dan McKee on Thursday at the press conference. Nancy, I'll start with you. A uh, lot to talk about here, but let's first start with the governor's tone. Um, he talked about the day of, oh, day of reckoning is coming, accountability is coming. He talked about all the people adversely impacted. He said nurses, uh, teachers, uh, students have all been impacted, and he, and he feels their pain. This was really in contrast to how he was back in December. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the seriousness of his recognition of the people impacted, the businesses impacted, the motorists, the working professionals. You know, a few months ago he was saying, oh, it's an extra 10 to 15 minutes. Now he's really um, sympathizing or empathizing with their um, plight. And also, you know, let's not forget the very first or maybe it was the second press conference held about this where he reprimanded um, Brian Crandall at NBC10 for daring to ask about um, if there was going to be any sort of accountability taken for for people from this and saying that was beyond the pale and now our day of reckoning is here mm -hmm. um, or at least around the corner right. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah it's I think he has perhaps correctly finally read the room on the reactions to his prior tone and is adjusting I have to also think Tim that uh, to Nancy's point you know we have to look at the calendar now and instead of this being a three month uh, closure that would have been hopefully long forgotten by the time the governor was seeking re-election in 2026. If they hit the targets, which they acknowledge are very tentative schedules without even having talked to the people going to build this new bridge, this could be going on into the summer when he would be campaigning for the Democratic nomination again in 2026. So, And the East Bay is an important Oh, yeah. area in a Democratic primary. I'm not saying this is all politics of the government, but certainly maybe a realization on That's his team that uh, we better have the right message for the voters on this or we're going to be cooked in 2026. And Eli, I want to talk about what accountability means. I think when, when people hear the governor talk about a day of reckoning and accountability is coming, they think inside DOT. They think that you know some heads could potentially roll after whatever uh, amount of time and they're looking at things. But when I hear accountability, I think 38 studios, and I think that uh, what the governor is talking about here is going after uh, private contractors that had wor previously worked on the bridge and suing them. Yeah, it's certainly telling that Director Peter Alviti was at that press conference with the governor, right? I mean, he's talking about accountability, and, and the, the, the head of the department is sitting right next to him. So. If he was out of the room, there might be a little bit more that we could extrapolate from that, like, oh, maybe he's on the he's on the cutting room floor coming up here. But there are a lot of companies, and remember, this project has been sort of caught up in legal battles f since its beginning. Yeah. Um, originally, it was given to Cardi Corp. There was an appeal there, and then it was given to Barletta, who, who currently has the contract, which, by the way, seems to be ending, and they're going to redirect that money rather than just give the work to Barletta to do it on an emergency basis. So I would look for certainly them looking at some of these companies. Did they mess up? Did they do something? Did they cut corners? And by the way, that's what the DOJ is looking at in their investigation of federal money put into this. Nancy, were you surprised to Eli's point that uh, they aren't using an emergency contract, they aren't sticking with Barletta, and they're doing an RFP process that will, what, take, they say, four months? July. 
July yeah, 15th. I mean, I think in some ways it's not a surprise because there has been such scrutiny on this. And when the DOJ announced they were investigating, you know, the what, what little we know about what they're investigating is basically like fudged reports on contracts and, and fudged updates. So, you know, the company that is or the contractor that has currently been charged with the work, it would seem they wouldn't just want to hand over the next, you know, two year, $300 million project to. On the other hand, it does seem like time is really of the essence here and what an RFP process means is another four months before we actually select a bid and typically the idea of an emergency contract where you don't put it out to RFP is you can do it faster. That's what Gina Raimondo did during the pandemic to get, you know, COVID hospitals built ASAP is we don't do this whole RFP process because it is an emergency and in the truest sense of emergency, this kind of is one. I also know Dan McKee and his advisors uh, look down on the Ramundo administration handing out so many emergency contracts That's without true. going through. They've taken pride in trying to, it, they say it's part of how they got into the ILO mess, was they were trying to go through the RFP process even though they kind of knew who they wanted to get the contract, but they didn't want to do what Ramundo had done. But I think, you know, even the, there's going to be a lot of questions here about DOT's competency to oversee all this. Just even, the, as Nancy said, the RFP to pick the company that will demo and build the new bridge. To put that together, as well as the inevitable grant applications to the feds, they might need consultants to help with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just the, the amount of uh, effort that's going to have to go into even getting this project ready and overseeing it, let alone actually doing it, is, is pretty extraordinary, especially on a compressed time frame. All right, we're going to take a break here on Newsmakers, but uh, when we come back, why don't we talk about the money? You referenced could be up to, they estimate, $300 million. Uh, S Senate and House leadership not so confident. That'll be the figure at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk money when we come back on Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. This is Ted Nisi joining us on a Reporters Roundtable talking about the Washington Bridge, Eli Sherman from Target 12, and Nancy Labin from the Rhode Island Current. As I said going to, into the break, I want to talk about money. Nancy foreshadowed that. 250 to $300 million is the estimate. Of course, state leaders would like a big chunk of federal money. Um, also, I, I love when you know, people talk, uh, officials talk about, well, we'll get the feds to pay for it. Last time I checked, <laughs> federal uh, income tax was taken out of my paycheck as well. So it is all taxpayer <laughs> money, but I, I understand it, it can hurt a little bit more when it's state money. Uh, Ted, state, uh, the, as I said, um, legislative leaders in the state are uh, putting up warning flags about that dollar amount. Yeah, House Speaker Joe Shikarchi in particular, especially since his chamber leads the budget process, is clearly uh, wants to set expectations with everyone. He's uh, he's already expressing doubt about if the 250 to 300 million dollar estimate will hold because again we haven't actually gotten the the winning bid for building this bridge, so we need someone to actually say how much they think it would cost them to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then all this talk of federal money, we do have. We learned this morning as we walked on the set, U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg will be in town on Tuesday, partly to see the bridge, partly to talk with officials. Um, but, you know, you need to put in grant applications for some of the big dollar federal programs that they're eyeing for this. That takes time to put together. Uh, and then you have an election coming up in November. Right now, uh, Jack Reed is on the Appropriations Committee in the Senate majority. And Joe Biden, a Democrat, is in the White House with his people at Transportation. If Republicans sweep Washington in November, they might look askance at Buttigieg sending tons. won't be the Transportation right, Secretary. Right, and they might look askance if it's January and this all isn't ironed out at sending a lot of money up to Rhode Island for a bridge that, frankly, the state did not maintain. I wonder if uh, we had someone on the show that, uh, oh, I think it was Congressman Auchincloss who said, raise the possibility of doing something like they did, what was it, in Minnesota, where they qu uh, passed a quick bill yes. to fund it entirely? I think that bill was actually, I looked into it after Augenclaw said it, and it was actually just to like, I think it was to deal with some river issue, like uh. you can build it anyway. But th that was a swing state where Republicans were involved. <laughs> there are no Republicans from this region on either side of the state border to help get anything through if Republicans get control of Washington. Eli, lest we forget, uh, taxpayers have already spent a sizable amount of money on the Washington Bridge, there was 78 million, right, earmarked uh, to fix a bridge. Half of that has been spent to repair it. That money's just flushed down the toilet, right? Or yeah, it seems it that way. it certainly seems that way. Uh, it came up during the news conference with the governor and, and it was asked just that way, what are we getting for that half of $78 million if now we just have to tear down the bridge? And he was asked if there was any value in that. He said, probably not a lot. So. 
uh, you know, it's it's important as we look forward to money to look back on exactly what it is that the state has been spending its money on. Half of $78 million is a lot of money that could go towards a lot of different things. And at this point, it sounds like there wasn't really much that was gotten out of it. Nancy, you cover the state house. I mean, how much oxygen will this suck out of the room, do you think, for this? We're in the legislative session now. They're hammering out the budget as we speak. Is this going to dominate uh, this session? I think it's going to be hard to see this dominate this session because they have to pass a budget by June 30th and we're not as Ted said we're not going to have a bid we're not going to have a price tag um, but I think it's going to sort of shape the conversations this year about what's coming down the pipeline for next year which has already been kind of the elephant in the room structural de deficits are coming back you know growth is slowing so the the warning signs have already been there I don't think in the fiscal 25 spending plan they're not going to put money into this because we don't know how much money to put hmm. but there's going to be hesitation even more hesitation than there already has been to start investing in other things like shoring up uh, RIPTA or DOC um, dealing with Medicaid if because next year they may not be able to do that at all that's a great point uh, by Nancy I hadn't actually thought about that Nancy that the, the misalignment now between this RFP process to get a real cost estimate and the budget process where they would like to be getting a firm sense of what where they're putting all the money by late May into June um, and maybe they will decide to earmark something I mean this is the last year to put our you know could they try to shift some of the remaining federal COVID relief money out of mm -hmm. some projects that might not get done and into the bridge project I mean they, they they have options I think you know if you're if the feds do cover 80 percent of this and it's 300 million that's 60 million dollars for the state plenty of money but in the big scheme of things, you can find $60 million over multiple fiscal years. Regardless where the money comes from, you like you hear Shikarchi like to say, I have a billion dollars in asks, right? So wherever that money's coming from, it means that it's not going somewhere else. And that oh, also can effects. create some friction, political headaches that Could be a useful cudgel for the speaker to tell everyone, I got to pay for the bridge, <laughs> I can't true. give you what you want. Yeah, I'd love to, but I can't. Right. Um, in 40 seconds or less, Ted, I mean, bring, brings that up, but... This is an election year for lawmakers yes. at the state house. And if I am one of the East Bay lawmakers who are, I think, all Democrats, um, I'm going to be a little worried if people's frustration is growing over the coming months. The filing deadline's not till the end of June. Uh, it's a presidential year. A Republican would have a lot of trouble. But those Democratic primaries, we've seen East Bay lawmakers lose their primaries before. So they may seek to show a little more activity than they have up to now, where they've generally been happy to sort of say, oh, we, we'd like them to fix the bridge, but not put any real pressure on anybody. All right. We have complete coverage on WPRI.com, including a piece that Ted, Eli, and I worked on looking back at 30 years of headaches for the Washington Bridge. You might want to check that out. Great archival footage of 12 News on there. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.